Hello everyone and welcome to today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar using movement analysis and artificial intelligence to identify and reduce workplace musculoskeletal injury risk. I'm Stephanie Murawski from WorkSafe Tasmania and I will be your moderator. Before we start, please take a moment to read the following slide about information received today. I'll now explain how you can participate in today's webinar. Please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit questions at any time during the webinar. Questions will be addressed at the end of today's presentation. Only presenter webcams will be used and today's webinar is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Scott Coleman. Scott is CEO, Chief Executive Officer of Preventure Pty Ltd. Scott has over 20 years experience working with elite athletes as a coach, physiotherapist and biomechanist and experience working in private practice treating injured workers. Scott has partnered with large organisations, workers' compensation insurance brokers and safety consultants to reduce the costs associated with workplace injury using wearable technology and data analytics. Welcome Scott. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, it's great to be involved in the WorkSafe Tasmania webinar series. So thanks so much for asking me to present today. And it sounds like it's a pretty bleak day in Tasmania. So um, a great day to, to stay inside and watch a webinar with a cup of tea. I'll just start the slides. There's a little bit of a delay. So I do apologize if there is a bit of a pause between some of the slides. So a bit more context with the background. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a trained sports scientist, but I'm also a trained sports physiotherapist. And during my career, I've focused on injury prevention and predominantly the biomechanics behind injury prevention. And, and so it's taken me across quite a few different sports, predominantly the repetitive loading sports. So rowing and athletics and triathlon, where if the movement analysis component is done correctly, an injury risk can be identified, measured and addressed. And so it, it enabled me to actually spend a lot of time with the Australian Institute of Sport, Biomechanics and Performance Analysis Department, where I learned specialist skills in movement analytics using, a, a, I'm not a technical person, but very quickly I had to learn to use wearable technology and analyze data. Um, we're talking about in Excel spreadsheets back in the day. So this is sort of thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of rows in Excel spreadsheets of data that could be processed to identify movements that were focused on, on exerting a force because the purpose being whether it's sports or whether it's in the workplace, it's all about the reason why we're analyzing movements is because we're trying to see how individuals generate force. So for example, if everybody on this call right now was to move the same weight box for the same distance, so from point A to point B, the force to do that task is the same for all of us. So the weight of the box is the same, the distance you've got to carry it is the same. The difference is we would all move slightly differently in order to generate those forces to perform the task. And there's definitely never been a right or wrong way of moving to generate particular forces. There are higher risk ways of doing it and there's lower risk of ways of doing it, but it's never black and white. And this has been a debate that's been, especially when it comes to lifting techniques, it's been a debate that's been around for a long time with the straight back bend knees principles. It's a perfect example because that method is not perfect for everyone. So movement analysis is really important because it enables us to identify different ways people generate force. Now, the slide that we've got on at the moment, this is this was from 2008. So this is the rowing, um, uh, the Olympic crew back in 2008. And the chart that we're looking at is the force. So force is on the y-axis and angle of oar is on the x-axis. So we've got basically the eight best rowers in the country at the time. And you can see that every single one of them, as much as they were highly trained, the way they generated the force was slightly different. And that came down to the different movements involved. They all had, from the naked eye, so from observation, they looked pretty much perfectly in sync. But when we measured their movements, there were always slight differences. And that was always going to happen because 
they're not all identical people. There are some taller, there were some shorter. There were some that had stronger legs, some that had stronger back, some had stronger arms. And so the key to performance in this instance was making sure that as many of those curves that you see in the chart were overlapping. And that's where technical changes were made by the coach. That's where the equipment changes were made to try to get that perfect because the most or the more curves that can be overlaid, the faster the boat would go. Now that's from a performance perspective. When you're looking in the workplace, it's very similar. It's not to this level of accuracy, but it's very similar in that if you can make sure that movement patterns are executed in a way that gets the task done, that the, generates the force in the right way, but without overload and without inefficiency. There was another, actually, before I go into this video, there was another um, another example from Elite Sport when we were working at the Institute of Sport was slalom kayaking, which is where there's a, so the rowing environment was very predictable. It was very enclosed. So the, re, the ability to analyze and assess the repeated movement and provide feedback and remeasure was a lot easier. But if you look at something like, and, and that would be like a warehouse environment or a particular or a production line where the workers tasks are repeatable movement analysis in that environment is a lot easier and a lot more useful than more unpredictable environments such as a home care environment where if you're trying to assess the movements of a worker performing home care for a disabled um, patient or an elderly patient it's a lot harder because there's external variables that can't be controlled similar to the whitewater kayaking or the slalom kayaking where as much as technique can affect performance slightly, it's the environment, it's where the rapids are, it's what the boat's doing, it's where the gates are, they're important. So in that environment, movement analysis was a lot more difficult and it played a smaller role in assessing performance and assessing injury risk because there were variables that were outside control. So again, we'll go through a lot of these environments now in this particular video where you can see different movement techniques and different ways of generating force in these different environments. So I'll have a look here. This is a, an elite weightlifter and this is high end movement analysis. This is one of the world's best weightlifters who's generating absolutely maximal force. Now in this environment, it is a closed environment, closed skill and movement analysis here is key for performance, but also for injury prevention. Now, one dimensional video is easy in this environment as well because it's the the movements are basically in their set planes there's not a lot of rotation so the force being generated is primarily in one direction so if you analyzed all of the top weight lifters there's not going to be a lot of difference because it's such a simple task with not a lot of external variables to influence the way they're going to generate this force and also even in the different weight categories you'll see that the most of the athletes move in the same way but now we're looking at a worker moving heavy objects in a different, a completely different environment. We're looking at a, a smelter, a, a, a foundry, where they're making consumables for the mining industry. So analyzing this worker's movements is a lot more challenging. It's a lot more difficult because of all of the different variables required to move that heavy object from one point to another. He's generating the force required to perform the task but he's doing it in a way that's suitable to him at that time. And here's another example of, this is quite a heavy piece of machinery that this worker has to maneuver into a small space. So movement analysis here, you, as much as you can put conditions in place to limit this worker's risk, you can see already, I'm sure some of you are looking at this thinking, well, that's probably not the best way of doing that because it's putting his body at risk. And here's another one where, this environment's a little bit more predictable, a little bit more controlled. And this particular worker has been trained to move in a particular way. And you can see that technique is a bit more similar to the weightlifters technique. So this worker knows he has to move a lot of boxes through a day. So he has developed a technique that has made it efficient for him to move in that way and use the muscles to generate the force in the best way for him. Now, if this particular individual had an injured knee, all of a sudden he'd have to change his technique and he'd have to move in a way that would unload his injured knee and put more and shift that load onto other areas in order for him to generate the force required to perform his tasks. 
Now, I don't know how many of you have seen this, um, this model or this particular video over the years, but the thing I love so much about this is it's taken um, physics and mechanics that are theoretically great, and they've tried to apply them to the human body. Now, the reality is this is not applicable. It's, it, this is oversimplified because this next phase, could, how many people have you ever seen actually lifting in that way with their bottom nearly touching the ground before they actually lift a weight. And the reality is it's not possible. So sometimes movement analysis outside of the environment that the task is performed can actually be detrimental. So the first component of movement analysis, I mean, a lot of what I've talked about is great, but we need to make this applicable to all of you in your day-to-day -day, um, operations and, and performing your tasks as safety professionals. So the, the most obvious movement analysis is what you all do day to day, and that is observation and opinion. You can take videos, you can take images, you can watch workers performing their tasks at the time, and that's the most obvious. It's very limited to the experience. The more tasks you've seen, or the more the, the longer you've been in a career, the more you understand the forces that are being generated and the movements required to generate those forces, the better your observation and opinion will be. But if you've got a first year graduate who hasn't been exposed to the safety industry, or hasn't been exposed to a lot of different tasks for over, over their career because they're just new and they're relying on their university experience, the observation and opinion way of analysing a worker's movements is going to be highly limited. It's very subjective. So the intra and interrelated rate of reliability has been shown to be poor by a lot of research because it depends on a lot of different variables between safety professionals, but even within safety professionals. An observation and assessment on one day in the morning can be completely different to one on Friday afternoon where fatigue has kicked in. Um, and that's where the movement analysis using observation opinion can be a bit, um, a bit flawed, but also it's very time consuming. You know, if you've got a large workforce, you don't really have the capacity to spend time with every single worker assessing their movements, analysing their movements, and then putting those um, opinions as a subjective assessments into writing and into reports. So it's, it's very time consuming and it's not efficient. That's why most people don't do it. The next level of movement analysis is two-dimensional video analysis. And this is starting to become more popular with uh, computer vision, uh, it's called, where there's um, all artificial intelligence and machine learning engines behind videos that are automatically doing what we see in this, in this image. So what this image does is basically using computer graphics to visualize the forces on the worker and the task that they're doing. Now with this particular two dimensional video analysis, you can see that the video angle has a high impact on the accuracy because of parallax error you've only got one angle to judge from. So the actual distance the worker's hands are from the camera will actually affect the angles at which you assess. And same thing, even with that bending motion, we don't know if there's a little bit of rotation involved with that bending motion. And if there is a bit of rotation, then the angle that we're gonna to try to measure is completely inaccurate. So parallax error is something you've really got to be conscious of, especially in the next few years, as people are developing smartphone apps to record one or two dimensional video, just one camera angle, and then they're gonna use that to assess joint angles, which is very, very um, riddled with parallax error. It's very time consuming as well. You gotta take collect, the more video you collect of the different workers, the more video you analyze, the better the results, but it's very time consuming. But I, it can also be very misleading due to that parallax error. You, you can use the data to make decisions, but in the end, if the data is not, valid and reliable, then it can be very misleading. So wearable technology has started to creep in and it's, it's been the sports sphere that has introduced what the, the benefits of wearable technology. So it's very rare these days that you'll see a professional athlete performing their sport without a sensor on predominantly on their upper back. So in that position where this worker has got a sensor, that around that T4, T3 region is where most athletes, if you have a look over the weekend, cricket, baseball, ice hockey, you name it, there's a little lump in their jersey and that measures their movements. It measures the trunk movements, it measures their acceleration and it measures 
a lot of the time in sports, it measures their tracking, their GPS, and that's for coaching, for tactics and, and that sort of thing. So the use of wearable technology in sports has really started to transition across to the workplace, primarily because it's become more cost effective. So the use of wearable technology now, it actually enables you to measure movements of large groups of workers over long periods. They can put sensors on them, wear them throughout a full shift. And that enables you to actually collect data on their movements over the full eight hours. You can see how they move when they're fatigued compared to when they're fresh. You can compare different workers performing the same task and identify which workers are moving more efficiently and which workers are not moving more efficiently and fatiguing faster. And that's been an interesting transition over the years. Um, but primarily the big difference is it's objective. So you're getting real measurements of workers provided the sensors have been validated and are reliable. You're getting real data from the movements of the workers. The number of steps, the number of impacts through their legs is a really good one. So some algorithms can actually detect when there's an impact through the worker's legs, which is a risk of ankle and knee twisting. We've got a lot of forklift drivers that we are identifying which ones are rushing on and off the forklift or truck drivers who aren't using three points of contact to lower themselves down. And there's a big impact going through their legs. And that's why I, I mentioned it's a big injury risk for ankles and knees and hips, but also that force is going straight through their pelvis and into their back. So an impact through the legs can actually flare up a back injury. It's about making sure, like I said, it's got to be valid and reliable. There is wearable technology now that hasn't been validated. So you've got to know, make sure that the data you're using to make judgments is valid and reliable and has been university validated. But it's much more practical than the previous two using one dimensional video where parallax error occurs and where subjective assessment without any video or imaging, that's a lot more practical. And as I said before, it's becoming a lot more cost effective. Every year, the sensors become cheaper. The platforms become more user friendly as well. Going back to um, the early wearable technology in the workplace, um, the, the platforms were overwhelming. There was almost too much data. So now we're finding out that there's more important data that can be used on a day to day basis without getting bogged down in too much, too much data. And then there's the gold standard of movement analysis, which is motion capture systems. So what you're looking at there, that image, the worker has reflective markers on them at specific landmarks. And then you're, you're surrounded by 27 is the gold standard, but you could, I think minimum of 10 infrared cameras. Now these cameras then pick up the movement of all of the, uh, of all of the markers on the worker. And that then is used by the, the computer software to actually measure accurately measure the movements of every limb. So you can measure exactly what the joint angles are. And so this is the most validated, it's the gold standard, it's used for most research. It's been used to validate the wearable sensors that I mentioned in the previous slide. Um, and it's mostly used for um, research, but it's not practical for health and safety considerations. There's no way you're gonna actually spend a good 30 minutes to an hour putting markers on a worker and then setting up all the cameras around them but also it's not cost effective it's a very very expensive way of doing things usually only universities and elite sports institutes that can afford to have this sort of technology but it can be too much data and i don't know whether you there was an old coaching terminology called paralysis by analysis where if you over analyze things if you get too much information you can actually get lost in all of the data and so if you've got joint a every data for every joint angle for a particular movement, it can become a bit distracting because you may be missing the really relevant stuff. It might be like a needle in a haystack. So the, while it's the gold standard and it's great for research, it's definitely not the um, option for the workplace. Now, what we're looking at with movement analysis is movement quantity, which is basically how far the worker moves, the range of motion. So range of motion is obviously very important for the safety industry because a lot of the standards are based on it, not bending too far or not reaching too high. So the first component of movement analysis is that movement quantity. How far is the individual moving in order to generate the force they need to generate to perform the task? Now, what we're looking at here are two, uh, two charts looking at trunk flexion early, same lift, same um, object being moved. So exactly the same task but we're looking at how far a worker moves during the, performing the task early in the shift and late in the shift. 
Now I've removed all the access to simplify this, but what we're looking at, you can, you don't need to be a biomechanics expert to realize that the more spikes there are in a chart like this, then the more movements are involved, the bigger the range and the more, um, the less efficient, the more movement is involved to generate the force. So this is the sign that this particular worker is fatigued because they're performing exactly the same task in the morning with a low amount of actual movements. They're not bending as far. Whereas in the afternoon, there's a lot more bending involved. So their legs are maybe fatigued or they're neurally fatigued. So the nerves and the neural pathway, the motor patterns are fatigued. So they're actually not moving as efficiently as they were in the morning. So that's an interesting one. Movement quantity is the first thing really you need to think about. And going back to one of the first slides where you're using observation and opinion, it's the movement quantity that's the key. You're, you're able to observe how high they reach, how far they bend. But the next, uh, the range of motion, sorry, and frequency, I've, I've talked about that. But movement quality is something that's really crept in in the last 10, 15 years. Again, coming from sports movement analysis. So the sensors were worn by athletes can determine whether whether there's more acceleration or more change of direction, more jerky movements involved with the athlete's performance. And when there is, we know the recommendations are to avoid jerky movements and uncontrolled movements in injury prevention in the workplace. It's exactly the same in sports. you efficient athletes who have a long successful career. So if you think about in tennis, Roger Federer is a great example. He is smooth on the court. And as a result, his number of injuries throughout his career have been a lot less than someone like Rafael Nadal, who scrambles all over the court. And he's had a lot of injuries, especially towards that back end of his career. Or for basketball, you've got someone like LeBron James, who is smooth and efficient with everything he does. And so his injuries are a lot less. And it comes down to acceleration of movements. It's that change of direction and rapid change of direction in their movements. So the chart we're looking at here is a comparison of two workers performing the same task. And we've overlaid their acceleration data, their peak acceleration. The pink line, you can see there's a lot less spikes, especially towards the end of performing this task compared to the blue line. And again, you don't wanna get, get lost in the detail, but without being a, a biomechanist or a movement analysis expert, you can look at this and say, all right, well, the blue line, the worker is moving a lot. There's a lot more uncontrolled movements. There's a lot more acceleration in their movement compared to the pink worker. So the next step would be, well, let's have a look at what they're doing. Has the blue worker developed a technique that's inefficient? Or is it something as simple as the blue worker may be shorter? And so they have to change their angle to, to generate the same amount of force as the worker from the pink line. So this is where movement quality is really important. And this even goes for everyone on this call right now. If we all stood up and very slowly bent forward and touched our toes or tried to touch our toes, if we're getting a bit old, it's a bit harder. It's actually a good stretch for our back. It's a good stretch for the ligaments and the muscles and the joints. But if we did it in a fast, jerky, uncontrolled way, it's an injury risk. So the range is exactly the same, but the movement quality, the control of that movement is completely different. And this is where movement analysis, where wearable technology can provide those insights. They can identify which workers are moving efficiently and which workers have poor movement quality and are moving in jerky and uncontrolled way. So the best way to measure movement quality is acceleration and velocity. So here's what it looks like when you can actually use wearable technology overlaid with video analysis. So this is combining several of the um, of the methods that we've talked about. I'm sorry if it's a bit jerky, but what we're looking at now, I've paused the video and we're looking at, you can toggle between, for this particular platform, you can toggle between angle. So you can see here, we're looking at the angle to vertical of this worker. You can actually toggle between control. So you can see when they move in a way that is where the movement quality is compromised but then they're combined for this load variable. So you can see here, there's actually a high load threshold, that red line. And you can see here the workers, the orange line, sorry, I should have explained this at the beginning. The orange line is the arm load or the arm angle or the arm control. The blue line is the back angle or the, the, the information from this, the back sensor. So it's the, the trunk angle, the trunk control. And you can see just in that, in that clip, and if we look at it now while it's paused, the orange line when he was cranking that arm crank to decouple this trailer, the arm load was above that high load threshold. And so 
this enables the safety team to look at it and try different ways. And this organization actually did try that, that video showed the worker facing the truck as he was cranking. So he was cranking the, um, the, the winch in front of him. They tried standing side onto the truck and cranking the winch to the side of his body. And that reduced that it enabled him to have his elbow closer to his body and it actually reduced that load. So by measuring it, you can see you get a lot more objective data to actually make those decisions and compare. Now, this is what information looks like when you collect data over a full shift. So what we're looking at here, there's scores across the top that actually quantify the load through the, this particular worker's body. And you can see the leg load score is quite high. So this would be one of those workers who has a lot of force going through their legs when they get in and out of a truck or when they get on and off of a forklift. So straight away, you can quantify that and see that as a priority area that you need to look into. But also, if you look down here, if you've got hour by hour data, you can see at what time during the shift, their movements are more demanding and you can actually spread them out. So while you're doing movement analysis on particular tasks, you're also looking at the movements throughout a full shift and hopefully you can distribute them evenly. So you can see here, and I know this is, a, this is for a truck driver as well. So there's a big gap in here where this worker was particular. This is, a, I'm assuming the first part is loading the truck, then there's a drive, and then there's unloading the truck. And you can see throughout this unloading truck phase, it's actually quite high. So looking into this and seeing whether something can be introduced, a manual handling aid at this particular delivery that could unload their back when they arrive um, using a pallet jack or something like that. So this sort of data enables you to analyze the movements over a long period, which is obviously impractical if you're trying to observe, use observation and opinion methods. But when you use sensors to collect data over long periods, it can be quite valuable. Now, this is the next phase. So analyzing movements is all great and it's all good, but what do we do with the data? You can do task assessments and you can identify better ways of doing a task and that's perfect. But if you've identified a better way of doing a task, how do you then train a worker to do that? Or how do you then identify whether a worker is doing that or whether they're, they're not responding and they're, they've developed bad habits that they can't break. And this is where artificial intelligence can actually make your job a lot easier. Now, we've come a long way from art, with art, artificial intelligence over the last, definitely the last five years, but there's four main types of which some of them are relevant to the safety industry. Some of them we almost hope won't be relevant because a lot of the safety professionals may be out of a job if they do become relevant. So. The first one, the most basic one is reactive machine learning. And that's where the, the algorithms and the, the, the code, the machine learning model or the, the AI model receives information and makes a decision based on that information. So that's where you provide a lot of inputs and it automatically provides an output based on those inputs. So that's the most basic form of artificial, artificial intelligence. You've got to train the model to be able to identify certain patterns in the information that goes in and then it spits out a response and the next time the next response is a limited memory where it can actually process previous information and learn from that so it can then and this it starts with reactive machine so whenever you start an ai model you start with reactive machine but then the limited memory is where it remembers everything you've already put in and it reproduces it so with a reactive machine, you teach it to say, these four inputs equal this one output. So that you enter that information and it does that in the first instance, but then the next point is it remembers that. So next time those four inputs go in, it automatically knows that four inputs in that order spits out this return because that's what happened last time. And the more of that that can happen, the better the model. So the limited memory um, is the next piece of uh, artificial intelligence. And you can uh, hopefully you're already thinking, well, in safety, if we're looking at what we've just looked at the last few slides, if you're inputting certain movement analysis data, so the range and the control, then an artificial intelligence engine can actually look at that and say, okay, well, with this data for range and this data for control, we're 90% confident that they're performing this task. So that can then allow you to sit back and say, all right, well, we're measuring all this information we don't have to ask the worker what tasks they did. So for that previous slide where there were those spikes throughout the day in the column chart, 
you don't have to go to that work and say, well, where were you at 10 till 11? Because there was a lot of load on your back. The artificial intelligence model will look at that data and say, this worker was most likely, if the, if the predictive capacity is not very good, they'll say 75% chance that this worker was moving milk crates at the Launceston depot. And then the more reports you get of workers moving crates at the Launceston depot, the better it will be able to predict that. And that's when variability comes in as well, because as I said, right at the very beginning of this webinar, different workers move in different ways to generate a force. Our goal is to input that into an artificial intelligence model that can say, there are 20 different ways of moving milk crates at the Launceston depot. The best way has been flagged as here. Here are all of these other ways. We need to train those workers so that they are all moving in the best way. And it can, with this limited memory capacity, it can do that. But it all depends on how much information goes into the model. The next one is theory of mind. And these next two are the ones where we hope it won't creep in to the safety industry because this is when it starts to make emotional and behavioral predictions. So this is when movement patterns can be tied to workers with psychosocial issues. And, and that's where it's tricky because if it's wrong, it can be catastrophic. So that's where you really, we hope that this won't creep in. It, we're 10, 15 years away from this to be creeping into anywhere. But they've already got software that uses webcams to read the emotions of workers so they could identify which workers have mental stress and mental health issues. But even that's got a level of inaccuracy to it. So we're still probably, I don't know, I'm bad at being, making these predictions, but we're still a long way from this being part of the safety wearable tech and safety analytics. And then self-awareness, which is where um, videos and sensors from all over environments are automatically being processed and, and the human's not involved anymore. It's all automated, which is uh, you know, sci-fi movie type material. But that's the fourth level of AI, um, which is, um, it's interesting to watch it progress through that. Now, how we can build AI. This is now, the next few slides are a bit more practical ways of how we can actually integrate a program that can read situations and not just provide feedback and the right feedback from a movement analysis perspective, but it can then use that information to train workers to change their behavior and then remeasure. And so this is a, an AI platform that we've built that we've been using for a while. It was working really well. It's making the training process a lot more targeted, a lot more specific and a lot more efficient. So first of all, Nudge theory, I'm not sure how many people have, have um, become familiar with nudge theory, but that's basically where the best way of changing human behavior isn't necessarily through throwing a lot of information at people. So our traditional learning method that we had at school and we had at university where a lot of information is thrown at us and then we've got to go away and try to remember it and reprocess it and focus. The best way to change human behavior is nudge theory where small amounts of information is delivered at, at effective times. So for workers, this is why on-site training and on-site feedback and um, is effective in safety because when you've got a safety professional talking to a worker on-site either while they're doing the task or just before or after they're doing time and providing coaching or feedback at that moment, that's the most effective as opposed to taking the word out, worker out of that environment, putting them in a classroom where nine times out of 10, most blue collar workers see that as a break. So they're sitting there with their cup of coffee or tea and they're listening. Some of the information will sink in, but most of the information will just be um, in one ear and out the other, unfortunately. There's a lot of research supporting that. The classroom based training for safety is not as effective as it could be. So what we're looking at here, if you've got nudge training uh, modules, small modules that are delivered at the most effective time, whether it's through a smartphone, whether it's through toolbox talks. So at the beginning of a shift or halfway through a shift, if the group get together, a little bit of safety training on a daily basis is a really effective model that a lot of organizations implement. But what we've got here is a simple linear flow of small training modules that are, that are engaging images, video, delivered to the worker through whatever medium, technology is usually better, but delivered to a worker at the most effective time. And that then hopefully 
will result in an action from that worker. But then we want to measure that action, whether that action is the same as before or whether the action has been improved as a result of the training that's been delivered. So that's the goal. And that's what we all want. But then when you introduce wearable sensors, you can actually measure the load of the tasks and measure the load throughout a shift and provide that feedback to the worker as well. So now you've got these training modules that are part of the nudge theory, part of the theory. You've all got most organizations in Australia. We work, we do a lot of work with the US as well. And Australia are by far ahead of the, the pack as far as creating really good injury prevention training content, like job task dictionaries and training platforms. And but a lot of it doesn't really change the worker behavior. But when you actually introduce load monitoring, you can measure which workers are doing things right and wrong and then use that video and use that data to show the workers. That's an, a, a really good step in the right direction because the workers who need the training the most can be identified. So going back to that chart before, if you can see which workers have more spikes in their chart throughout a shift, you know, they're the ones you need to actually spend a bit more time with and actually provide that feedback or even live feedback. So those workers wear the sensors throughout a shift. And if it's a sensor platform that provides alerts when they move in a way that's high risk, then that feedback can actually then change their action. And again, then we remeasure. Hopefully you've got live monitoring, the worker redoes the task in a way that doesn't get an alert. Hopefully that's a positive outcome. Or the worker wears the sensors, the sensors provide alerts, they ignore the alerts, and then they continue doing the things the same way. And that's where you can actually use the data and use the video that we showed you earlier in the training modules. So then it's engaging content. So when you've got the feedback to the worker, maybe that, that won't work, maybe they'll hear the alerts and ignore them. But then the next day or two days later, they receive a module highlighting the task that they were doing when they received an alert. And that will hopefully drive a change in the action. So then hopefully you'll get a, a positive outcome there, but you might again, get a negative outcome. So when training modules use load and data and video, it does increase worker engagement. But then the next piece is providing that feedback loop. So when you're providing the training modules, you're providing the worker with feedback, you then remeasure and you see, all right, is that actually changing? If it's not changing, then you need to make changes to either the training modules or the feedback mechanism. But you need that, that feedback, you need that loop to actually assess whether it has been effective or not and make changes. But then you wanna understand whether the workers are learning from the modules. Again, we don't want them to just click through and complete it because it's a tick box exercise, tick box exercise and they just move on. So that's where you want to introduce some sort of Q&A component. So you give them some information in the modules. So the modules have a piece of information and then a, one or two questions, three, five minute modules, a bit of information, a video. And we found the best bet is providing a video of a task being performed with the chart down the bottom. And then the first question is asking the worker to identify the load. So the question would be when the worker moves milk crates, the lawn Ceston depot, where is the high, at what point in the task is the load highest on the back? And I'll look at the chart and I'll see what the worker is doing. They'll say the load is the highest when they remove the crate from the truck. The next question would be, how can you move in a way to reduce that load? So the first question is I, I, having the worker identify the load. The second question is getting them thinking about how to reduce the load. So again, they'd look at the video and they'd see that the worker is lifting with straight legs and bending their back completely. And so the answers would be the worker needs to use their legs more. It would reflect the training the, the workers have received. And so then they've got that conception of, I've understood the risk. Now I've looked at a way to reduce the risk. So the next time I'm doing it, I'll remember that. So you've got that Q and A component. You can see which workers actually learn from it, which workers are getting the answers wrong, in which case you then look back to the training modules. If there's particular modules where the workers are getting a lot of the answers wrong, you need to then modify those modules to make the message simpler or provide more modules so that the message actually sinks in and the, the workers actually understand it 
and they actually move in a way that reduces the load, reduces their injury risk, because that's what we want at the end of the day. So you've got two big components there, wearable sensors and smartphone technology or tablet technology or mobile technology, which enables you to deliver the training and the modules in the right environment without the reliance on PowerPoints in a classroom-based situation. So that's a, that's a feedback loop that we've found and it's been built on a lot of behavioral psychology where you've got movement feedback, you've got knowledge feedback, but it's a loop that it, it's never set in stone. It's never a matter of here's the training content, we've done it now, it's locked in, off you go and deliver the training content. It's a matter of seeing and, and using that technology to collect feedback and identify what's working and what's not working and then change it. And that goes back all the way back to the very first slide, back to elite sport. It's always this feedback loop of seeing what's working, what's not working, making changes, remeasuring, and then adjusting accordingly. And this is where I said the, the smartphone technology has evolved to the point now where information can be delivered to workers at any time and using a really effective medium. So make sure you, you sort of start looking into that using wearable technology and using smartphone or tablet technology to, um, to start helping you with the movement analysis and with the delivery of your, your services to reduce injury risk off the back of the movement analysis. And I think, yes, that's it. So thanks so much for, for taking the time. Um, and if you've got any questions, we'll, we'll answer them now. Thank you very much, Scott, for your presentation today. And as uh, Scott mentioned, we'll now take uh, any questions uh, from the audience. So please use the questions window on your control panel to type and submit uh, any questions. So a uh, first question, uh, Scott, you uh, talked about changing the behaviour of a worker, but would the use of wearable technology be better to identify the actual source of the risk and then implement controls to address the root cause as per work health and safety legislation? An administrative control should only be used to address any remaining risk as per your example, the design. Yeah. 100% agree, um, but similar to what we said before, the first, as we all know, with the hierarchy of control, trying to eliminate the risk is always that first option. And using wearable technology to measure different ways of doing it, to eliminate, so making changes to eliminate the risk is the first step by all means. But even then you'll go to environments where the situation has been, or the, the environment has been modified to limit the amount of variability between workers so that the task has been designed so that it can really only be done in one particular way, which is the safest possible way. And you measure all of the workers throughout an eight hour shift or a 10 hour shift, you'll still find that a lot of them are moving differently. And a lot of them have still got certain movement patterns that are outside of the parameters that you tried to control. And so that's the next level of, um, I suppose, the next level of, risk reduction or risk management is then making sure that those workers understand that they are moving outside of the parameters that you've tried to control and then educating them about the reason why those parameters were put in place in the first place. So going back to what I said before the very beginning, if we everyone on this call moved a box from point A to point B, you can make sure that that box, first of all, if it's uh, avoidable that we can have a conveyor belt to move the box. The reality is there's a lot of environments that that's never going to be possible. So if that environment has been modified to the point where the distance is the shortest possible, the box is at the right height and it's not overloading us. It's the right weight. It's the right height. It's the right distance from the body. You can keep it really close to your body. There's still going to be variance between how every single worker or every single person on this call moves that box. So that second step is yes, every, all those variables have been controlled. The environment is as safe as we can make it. Now let's see which individuals are still moving in a way that has high load on their body and over a long period and see, um, see if we can change that. Sorry, that was a bit all of a right, long-winded answer, but I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Scott, are you just able to uh, go over your, your background um, in uh, in this area again, uh, one attendee sort of wasn't able to uh, hear the first part of the presentation. Oh, okay. Um, well, sorry for everyone else having to hear my story again. 
but um so the first my career has basically taken a biomechanics focus from the outset so i started with a sports science degree i really enjoyed movement analysis so i spent a lot of time with the australian institute of sport um with a postgraduate scholarship in biomechanics but then focused on as a sports physio as well so i always had that interest of movement analysis from an injury prevention perspective and the movement analysis component was crucial in uh, obviously in sports because in sports performance is about generating force and the different ways athletes move to generate that force and measuring those movements to see if it's the best way first of all to perform but second of all to prevent or to reduce injury risk and then I transitioned a lot of those skills across to the workplace. Actually, something I didn't mention earlier in the um, in the webinar was when I was working in elite sport, my mother working as a nurse towards the end of her career sustained a back injury where she was moving a patient. And I'm sure anyone who has anything to do with healthcare is familiar with this story. Nurses put the patient first. So my mother was moving a patient in an awkward position and injured her back and ended up having seven levels of her spine fused, which resulted in an early end to her career. But ongoing pain and dysfunction for the rest of her life. So I've lived through a workplace, avoidable workplace injury firsthand. And that was a big motivator to actually start looking into transitioning the injury prevention processes using movement analysis in sport across to the workplace. Because my mum, her injury prevention program consisted of a safe lifting manual, which she saw when she started her role five years earlier. And that was it. There was no refreshes, there was no ongoing modification. So if she had a way of receiving feedback as to what she was doing that was putting her at risk, her injury was 100% avoidable. And that's the case for everyone's family, friends, people doing physical work. It's 100% the case where if you measure, if there's movement analysis involved, then the risks can be reduced and we can protect these people from injury. Thanks, Scott. Uh, what is the minimum percentage of a work area needed to be measured to be able to confidently extrapolate uh, that information across the whole work area? Yeah, great question. And that is the same sort of, or the answer is the same for every research paper. So you can find a research paper that has five to 10 subjects and compare that research paper to uh, the same paper with a hundred subjects. The more data you collect, the better you are at um, making decisions. Or well, first of all, the more data you collect, the more chance you have of identifying and quantifying the risks, first of all, but also the more data you collect, the better you'll be able to make a good judgment on the decision. So really at the at one end of the spectrum, if you can collect, if we're talking about task assessments, if you can go to a site and put a set of sensors on one worker performing all of the physical tasks, then that's almost like a starting point. That's insights into the physical demands of all those tasks. If you then put the sensors on three different workers performing all those tasks, that's the next level. You've at least got three different data sets of the same tasks. But then if you integrate the sensors into the workplace, and you have the sensors rotating around the different workers and the data set continues to grow, then every week, every month, as that database grows, the better, the more accurate the insights are. Thanks, Scott. Is there an opportunity to integrate sensor technology for forklifts, et cetera, and worker sensor, measuring relationships between workplace incidents due to fatigue, physical and uh, mental? Mental fatigue, I'm not going to touch because I'm definitely not a, a psychologist or um, and that that's not my area. So as a biomechanist, it's purely about movement analysis. But I love the thought I, I've spent since I transitioned out of sport in 2014, I've put sensors everywhere. I'm a science nerd and I just collect data for everything. And yes, we have put sensors on forklifts and workers and looked at the integration between all that. But the reality is the more sensors we incorporate, the more expensive the system is, but also we're at risk of noise. So that's where, as I said earlier, with the gold standard being that um, motion capture system, when you measure, you can almost get to the point where you get distracted by all of this extra data and it's harder to see where the real problem is. 
So yes, it's definitely possible. And we do that. We do special projects all the time. We just had a project with a casino where they purely wanted to look at wrist load for the blackjack dealers. And they wanted to compare different dealing tables as to the wrist load and the back angle as well. And so we, we always do special projects for that in that regard. And so um, definitely we, if you've, if you've got a particular interest in some, in a problem that you need to solve, then, um, then yeah, let me know, reach out and we'll look at a way of putting sensors on and measuring data and then, and then exploring. Thanks, Scott. How far away are commercial exoskeleton suits? No, they're, no, they're available now. There's various different types available to the market. And we've actually, we had three different manufacturers using our sensors to demonstrate the value of their product to their clients. So their sales team were using our sensors to show what the load on the worker was with and without the exoskeleton. Um, I love them, but I'm not the person who has to put them on at the beginning of the shift or take them off at the end of the shift. And the different models and the different types have different limitations. So there's some that actually workers feel like it's holding them up in this position to the side. So if they've got to do something in front of their body, the exoskeleton is actually pulling them back. There's some that actually, while they remove load from the shoulders, they transfer that load into the back. And so a lot of them feel like, yeah, their shoulders feel great and they can drill overhead all day. But at the end of the day, their back's actually feeling really stiff and sore because of the transfer of load through the body. So every year it evolves and gets better. And I'm sure, well, actually, again, I'm bad at predictions. Going back to that AI slide, I don't want to sort of start predicting when these models will be emotionally predictive, but um, every year it improves. And, and it is definitely an area there's a lot of investment going on. So with the more investment that goes on, the more of these companies that bring exoskeletons out of universities, that's actually another good point. When they've come out of a research facility, then they're usually quite good. There's a couple of just uh, the, the earlier ones have been sort of left behind because of that functionality component. Thanks, Scott. Uh, a comment, you insist there is only one best way to lift a box, do a certain HMT, but workers have different personal characteristics. Workers may need to do the same task differently. Yes, 100%. I don't insist that there's only one way of ever doing any task. But I do insist that every individual has their best way. So it's not at no point will I ever say, and I have, I don't think I'd mentioned during the webinar that I said that there's one way that's the best way for every single task. But what you can do is measure different ways of doing it, establishing a benchmark of the best way that is advisable using the load, but then measuring everyone against that. Because no, there's no way every single person is going to hit that benchmark every single time. But if you set that parameter of this is the most, this is the recommended way, this is the way we want everyone moving as best possible, that's where you want to start. And then if different workers, like you say, if there's shorter workers, taller workers, if a shorter worker is well, well above the benchmark, that's when you go in and say, you need, let's try it with a, a stool or let's try it with a platform or let's try to implement things and then remeasure and then see, yes, all right, that individual is now moving in a way that's closer to the benchmark. So we're happy. They're closer to the way that's the best for them. Thanks, Scott. And a final question, is the software that Actually, a few more questions have come through. <laughs> I must have been a jinx, jinx that one. Um, is the software development <laughs> that you've you've spoken about uh, in your webinar developed by Preventure? Some of it is, yeah. Um, I can't remember which slides. So the video slide with the data down the bottom, that's ours. And the, the, the following slide with the data throughout a full shift. So those are both ours, but all the rest, um, a lot of the other images and a lot of the other um, the charts were not. Some of them were from research papers and some of them were from case studies. So yes, some Thanks, of it Scott. is, but some of it is. And there are different, lots of, lots of different types out there and you'll find that each different type of wearable addresses or focuses more on different areas. Thanks. Have you conducted a uh, task analysis for any local government? Yes, actually a great question because this whole journey for me started with a local government. So it was the Gold Coast City Council when I was still working for the, I was working for Athletics Australia and the Queensland Academy of Sport. And I also had a clinic um, where one of my patients was responsible for 
reducing injury risk for the I think it was three thousand odd workers in the um in the construction and maintenance departments. And that was, she was just asking how I use technology to reduce injuries with athletes and modify and, and modify their techniques and training load. And so we used the sports wearables that I was using for athletes on these workers. And that started this whole journey. So yes, it was actually a really good story. There was one particular construction group that had three generations in the one team. There was a grandfather, the father and the son. And the assumptions were that the grandfather was the highest risk and the son who was 18 was the lowest risk. But when we measured their movements, the grandfather actually, while he was chronologically the oldest, his training age was the highest. He'd been doing these tasks for so long that he'd become so efficient at doing these tasks. And so he actually had the lowest injury risk, even though he was the oldest person there. And it was the son that had the, the grandson, sorry, that had the highest injury risk. So that's a story for um, local governments. We've also done some, Oh, gee, Denver City Council in the US, we've done quite a few in Australia. So yeah, but none of them are exactly the same because every organization has different problems. So it's a matter of conducting a pilot based off the current problems, whether it be claims, whether it be new tasks, new workload, and then um, and then adjusting accordingly and, and providing the data that, that need that's needed to solve the problem. Thanks, Scott. Uh, how does the wearable tech Sorry, how does the wearable sensor technology measure force? It doesn't measure force. So like I said before, it's not about measuring force. So for every task, there is a set amount of force that needs to be applied at certain angles over certain distances. It's about the way the individuals move to generate that force. So going back to my example of moving a box from one point, one side of the room to the other, the force is exactly the same. So you can measure the force, you can measure the weight, you can measure the acceleration to move it, but it's going to be the same for every worker. What you really want is measuring the worker's movements to generate that force. And that's where the different variables between individuals actually make a difference. The taller, the shorter, the ones who have strong upper bodies and weak lower bodies, the ones that have stronger trunk and weaker arms, they will all move in ways to generate that force differently. They'll move in ways that optimize their individual strengths and weaknesses. And so it's that, so we don't measure force, we measure the way MOOC workers move to generate the force. Thanks, Scott. Question, you are, com you, you are comparing different body parts in your data analysis, um, back versus arms, but different body parts can withstand different forces, vibration. How do you design the data analysis when you are comparing forces between different body parts? So we don't compare between different body parts. We collect data from different body parts to enable the safety professional to assess that load. So we focused on shoulder and back because those are the most common body stressing injuries. They're the most costly body stressing injuries, but also they're the most often reoccurring. So as soon as a worker sustains a shoulder or back injury, it's very, very highly, well, the biggest predictor of shoulder or back injury is previous back shoulder or back injury. So that's why we just focused on shoulder and back. We don't actually compare them. We sometimes visually show them overlaid because in that chart that you saw at the bottom of the video, they're both there so that you can actually see which one you need to focus on. But it's not a direct comparison and you don't want to compare because there's no comparison between shoulder load and back load. You want to be able to assess them individually. Thanks, Scott. Vibration can also be a risk factor to MSD injuries. Is vibration analysed in pre or by pre-venture? It can, but it's not something that we focus on at the moment. But similar to what I said before, we've done a lot of projects with sensors on equipment to measure the vibration of the equipment and how much of that a vibration for the equipment actually transfers into the worker. So we measure the vibration of the equipment, the vibration in the worker, how much is transferred. But again, there's a special project that I love, um, but it's not in our actual automated platform. Uh, so in that case, if, if somebody wanted, someone on the call wanted to do that, um, they just let me know and we'll send some sensors and then we'd extract the raw data and we'd help them do the project. All right, thank you very much, Scott.
And with no further questions uh, coming through, uh, we'll begin to conclude today's webinar. So thank you very much to our presenter today, Scott Coleman from Pre-Venture PTY LTD. And thank you to everyone for attending today's WorkSafe Tasmania Month webinar, using movement analysis and artificial intelligence to identify and reduce workplace musculoskeletal injury risk. At the end of today's webinar, you will receive a survey. We please do appreciate you providing us with your feedback. Today's webinar has also been recorded and will be made available following WorkSafe Month on WorkSafe Tasmania's YouTube page. To find out more about WorkSafe Tasmania Month and other initiatives funded by the Work Cover Tasmania Board delivered by WorkSafe Tasmania, please head to worksafe.tas.gov.au. Thank you everyone for joining us.